Happy Easter, everyone, and um, welcome back to the uh, live exchange. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to accomplished investor and expert stock picker John Human of Vox Markets. So, welcome, John. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Yeah, not so bad. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to uh, a nice break. But before we get there, we've still got plenty of stocks to uh, to run through, and, some, and lots of sort of questions from the audience. So, anybody wants to put some. Uh, questions to john or myself then just drop them into the uh the chat box but over the past two weeks we've had quite a bit of key macro data we've had the uh the central banks making decisions as often than expected sort of inflation but before we sort of dig into the details john i don't suppose you could quickly remind people what type of investor you are and what like what stocks you quite like yeah, uh, so I mean, what type of investor am I? I mean, I, I sort of have a leaning towards value, I must admit. Uh, although I do have some growth uh, companies that, I, that I've uh, invested in, and they have, as it happens, been my best performance. The value value side of things is not working out particularly brilliantly, nor has it for some time uh, generally. Um, so yeah, what, what I, I, mean, I, I sort of favour, you know, deep research. I mean, I've been uh, um, uh, an analyst in, in a past life, uh, an equity analyst, and uh, was editor of the Investors Chronicle. So the, the whole, for, for nearly a decade, so the whole approach is very much driven by, you know, digging into to companies, uh, really looking in depth at kind of the markets they operate in, the numbers behind them, uh, and, and really sort of, you know, kicking the tyres yourself if you can. I love a bit of scuttle, but I do like getting out there and, uh, and sort of experiencing the companies that I might invest in. Um, I think it gives you, you know, lots of clues uh, as, as to how well or, or not company run companies are. Yeah, good. And then what's your sort of like just long term, what's your sort of your returns been? I know you've probably had difficulty investing because if you've been an it's, analyst, you've been barred. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, to be honest, I, I left the Investors Chronicle a few years ago and I really started sort of taking control of, of some of my money then. And uh, you know, prior to that, it was all run through, uh, you know, company pensions. So looking at that, the returns have done very well because... Because actually, a lot of that the, the weighting is that is towards sort of you know global indices, and and global indices are very much dominated by big tech, and big tech has done very very well. So, so actually, the whole pension side of things, which I bet rarely look at, it's done extremely well. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, you know, it's been it's been a difficult couple of years for investing. I've sat largely on cash, um, you know, throughout throughout the worst of it. So that's protected me, really, from uh, from, from from some of the sort of vagaries of the market. Um, and, and and aside from that, you know, I'd say I'm fairly flattish over the last couple of years, um, which I which I'm not too too uh, unhappy with, I have to say. No, that's sort of outperformed the market, particularly <laughs> on the small cap sector. Everybody's been absolutely battered. Yeah, and I mean, just... I, I, I'm not entirely small cap. I, I must admit as well. So you know, I've got I've got a, a mix of large, small, a few investment trusts in there as well. You know, so so, so I, I, I'm fairly agnostic in terms of size and and, and asset type. Okay, well, we'll go through those in a, mm -hmm. in, in, in a bit in a bit more detail later on. But um, just in terms of, I've got, I understand you've got a new sort of service, stock picking service coming mm. out um, in the next couple of months. Can you just talk a bit through what that is, what's it called, how you're seeing it, where it's positioned in, what it's going to offer investors? Yeah, so um, so uh, listeners might remember a, a publication called Growth Company Investor, um, which uh, which has been running for many many years. Smoking that was David Thornton, wasn't it, John? It is, and David's you know the, the plan is for David to come aboard and uh, and and. And right, so we've 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 taken that, that over, and we're going to be sort of uh, putting out putting out the kind of in depth research that I've, I've alluded to to earlier through that through that service. You know, it will be, you know, it won't be sort of daily news type stuff. You can get that through through the Vox website itself. Um, it's going to be more focused on producing in depth bits of research on companies that you know we feel that we have conviction in as as, as good picks. Um, and, you know, it might be sort of two, initially sort of two reports a month uh, and hopefully expand from there. But, um, yeah, as I say, the, you know, it will be focused on the, the kind of in-depth, um, you know, very much fundamentals-driven research that, that, that I favour as, as an investor. Uh, and we'd like to offer that to, 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 the, to the public at large. And it will be, uh, it will initially be free. Oh, wow, great. <laughs> Hmm. fabulous brilliant well when's the when's the likely go live date because I'll, I'll definitely be a subscriber I, I think we i think we'll be up and running by uh, by sort of early may I, I i think that's that's the plan anyway okay got good. a few, few stocks in mind some of them we might talk about today 
Okay, good. Well, um, we've had a few uh, questions from the audience um, overnight, in fact, and one was um, from a guy called. Um, uh, I think I don't do this very, very, very well, or I can't remember exactly. Not name. good at this share stuff. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> anyway, he was asking about um, <laughs> perennial disappointer. Actually, I remember owning this, but it's BT group. Mm. And I remember being one of the uh, the El Cid variety who actually came in on the uh, on the privatisation back in 1984. And I bought as original value Earl Price at one pound thirty. It was a roaring share at the time. Did really well for me. And now it's below there. I think one thirty. So one ten. Is it one ten? Yeah. Can you take yeah. so that it sort of totally tripped over what sort of forty years? Can you take us through what what your latest view on the? Um, I'm on not. Ha- I'm, it's, I mean, it's, it's it's a real you know dog. Uh, in my portfolio, it has to be said. Uh, and and the, really, the only reason I'm hanging on to it is because, uh, you know, can it get any worse? <laughs> so, so, is that you know, an investment thesis? In the case of this case, you know, there was a thesis behind it that, you know, that it was a sort of deep, deep recovery play, um, that, that, that there were activist investors coming on board, that, you know, Open Reach is actually quite a good business, um, that, that that it's laying, you know, it's really investing heavily in its fibre network, and there were lots of, you know, tailwinds to, to, to really support that rollout for, 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 for high-speed broadband across the country. Um, you know, there were some underperforming parts of the business that could be turned around, uh, and, you uh, uh, and generally speaking, you know, the idea was how much worse can it get? This was uh, this was this was a company in you know in desperate need of uh, uh, the other sorry the other um, rationale was that it would sell J- uh, BT Sport as as an encore asset. Um, now it didn't sell BT Sport, which I thought was a poor decision. Um, you know, put it into a JV instead. Um, you know, it's, 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 it feels non-core and expensive, an expensive business to operate in. You know, highly competitive content, and 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 you know, I know that there was this, you know, back in you know, sort of a decade or so ago, um, that you know, there's this big trend towards you know what they call triple play. So, you know, you had companies offering broadband, landline, uh, and uh, and mobile, and then you had quad play to so adding the content layer on top as well. But you know, you've got a lot of specialist content services out there, and you know, it felt it feels incongruous to BT, and I really, as I say, was surprised they they they, they JV'd it rather than sold it. Um, I think it's a mistake. And uh, what was the other thing? I, I mean, you know, the BT business side of things really, you know, it's it's been struggling for, for many, many, many years. Um, and uh, yeah, so so you know my my and as, I mean I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you should experience companies that you potentially invest in, and, and you know as a customer, my experience of this company recently has been diabolical, <laughs> diabolical. Um, I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, um, they they really are, are not a joined up organisation. They 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 really have some issues on the sort of customer facing customer service side of things, and this is this is a highly competitive market. So you know we know their numbers are okay, but it's because they're pushing prices up. Um, and you know as you push prices up, people can go elsewhere. You know there are other options than, than BC these days. So you know the, the, the consumer marketing side of things is is uh, is, is faces from very stiff, stiff to, uh, headwinds. I'd say. Why don't you sell oh, the shares oh, then, John? Why? Because because you know I because you know I've I've, I've lost a fair amount on them, and you know it may be that the, the, the activists you know get a bit louder and something actually happens here, um, and something really does need to happen. There is a new chief executive on board. I would love to chat to her to ask what what her plan is to turn this company around. You know, both as a customer or ex customer now and shareholder. Um, what what's the plan? So. Give new management a chance. Hit, you know, hear, hear, hear them set out their stall, uh, and hope the activists actually sort of really start to make some some noises that points this company in the right direction. <laughs> the, 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 the thing that moved the shares most recently was the sale of uh, the old post office tower, BT Tower. I mean, <laughs> you know, when 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 it's a property deal that moves the share price of a big telecoms company, you know something's not quite right. But you know, to, in uh, in BT's defence, this is a sector wide issue. Yeah, there isn't there isn't much uh, to, to like about the telecom sector in the UK. You've got yeah. Vodafone, Virgin Media, both of them are horrendous, horrendous performers as well. Yeah, telcos worldwide seem mm. to be in pretty much dire straits. They can't compete against the big sort of like you know media and um, and internet guys. Unfortunately, Just no, the- no. But why? But so why bother with the media? You know, stick stick to the knitting. Yeah, they become the very best at, at, at something, and that mm. that should be providing connectivity. We are a connected world. How on earth can the companies that provide that connect, connectivity do, not be doing well? It's it's insanity. Poor yeah. management, poor regulation in the UK. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's 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 uh, you know, anecdotally, I took the train to Paris recently, and you know, you're sort of 
your network's dropping out as you, you, you're going towards the tunnel. You get on the other side of, of, the, of the channel uh, and it's like, you know, it's like sort of the heavens open and the sun shines down and the mobile 5G signal picks up and you don't lose it for the next week. Mm. Um, you know, we've got something wrong with, this, with telecoms in this, com- this country. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what they could do. <laughs> this would be my plan, <laughs> is that they should sell their infrastructure to an infrastructure investor because well, they've got a lot of money for it. Yeah, well, there, I mean, there was a plan many years ago, <clears throat> and certainly there was a suggestion that OpenReach would be spun out. Mm. Uh, and again, you know, this is where there was a huge regulatory failure because, you know, they, they're essentially Chinese walled it within BT itself. And, and, and you know, that, that was a very bad decision on the regulator's part. It should be a separate company. Open reach be a separate company. It's where, it's where the expertise lies, and and you know a, a marketing and telecoms organisation, which is what the other side of BT is, you know separately makes makes a lot of sense. I agree. Spin out the infrastructure, yeah. and that's another reason for hanging on to the shares. Something yeah. might actually happen that's sensible. Yeah. Well, it gets a nice dividend as well. And I, I did not. I did yeah. see the consensus target price for a BT is one pound eighty six compared to one pound ten. So yeah, yeah, there's plenty of upside. Okay, let's move some cash. Let's move to the sort of like the other end of the uh, the market cap spectrum. We've got uh, Angler Angling Direct, which I think is only a twenty seven million market cap rather yeah. than a ten billion uh, market cap, and it's, it's... a specialist in sort of like um, fishing tackle and um, mm. offering anglers um, equipment and stuff like this. But what's what sort of surprised me is that it's got a really good name. It's got a really good brand, but its margins are really small. It's only like 2% EBIT margins. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's, a volume, it's a volume business, isn't it, really? Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's just so cheap. You know, you, you know, you talk about 27 million market cap. It's sitting on, you know, best part of 15 million of cash. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you basically got, you know, the UK's leading supplier of, of angling equipment trading on an enterprise value of, you know, just over 10. This is deep. This is deep value. And it's, it's a very good company. You know, the numbers were out recently. They were very, very good. Um, but, you know, I think there's some concerns about its European business. So, you know, it, it does compete in Europe uh, online. Uh, whereas in the UK, it's a mix of online and, and, and physical retail. Um, but, but Europe is, is a very sort of price competitive market. Mm. Um, so, you know, there is a concern that, that that is a drag on the business. It's opening a shop in, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, it, 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 well, maybe, m- very soon, in fact. Um, but, but yeah, no, UK sales were, were, um, were, were decent. Uh, and this is, you know, this is, this is a very, very popular sport. Very, very popular sport. Not one that I, not the one that I engage in, but but you know I understand living out in the sticks as I do. You know, there's a lot of people that that that, that love their angling. You haven't scuttle butted this one at all. Uh, well, no, I say look, you know, they've got a lot of lot of friends who, who are uh, who are anglers, and uh, yeah, this you know, there's my scuttle butt. There's yeah. my scuttle butt. But it's you know, a very decent company, and I say you know that 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 cash pile, and you know, uh, just really really you know means the shares are outstandingly cheap. Yeah. Can you see the shares there? Can you see the chart there, uh, John? Mm, mm, okay. okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, what what price would you say is fair value? I did actually look at the uh, the brokers. We've got forty eight p from Singers. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's. I, I think there's just a more just a, a, a structural growth story in here. I, I don't tend to look at target prices. I, you know, if I like the yeah. business, and you know, there's 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 room for expansion, and uh, you know, as I say, the European side of things could could evolve quite nicely. Uh, although it's the, it's the worry at the moment. Then then you know, I just I just sort of hang on because I think there's upside. There's a big, a big strategic investor came in, a company called Kelsa. Um, you know, took a, took quite a chunky stake. Uh, and, and you know it's, it's easy to see why, but yeah, yeah. So I don't look at target prices, but you know there, there is definitely room for uh, for sort of uh, profit expansion here. Yeah, that's a Kelso John. I can't remember what his name is. He's the CEO, isn't he? John, mm. The guy from um, oh, it was one of the brokers, wasn't he? I can't remember. Anyway, he's, he's, he specialises in uh, retail. Okay, good. Well, let's move to an- another one. I mean, I've. I don't want to highlight. I actually own um, Michaelmers Brick, which is a ah. premium brick manufacturer, which again is super cheap. It does building products, obviously, and that sector has been absolutely battered of late. Um, but it came out with surprisingly good results this week compared to the rest of the market. I mean, in big picture wise, we've seen brick volumes over 2023 reduced by over 30 percent, but actually their sort of like sales increased like for like one or two percent. So they held up and you have to ask why they held up. And the main reason is 
is that around about a third of their business is in sort of architectural, sort of like bespoke buildings. So it goes into train stations, museums, schools, universities, which like their buildings to be aesthetically pleasing. Another 40% goes into repair and maintenance. So your old sort of like, you know, properties that like to need a new wall or need new chimneys and this sort of stuff. And it's all sort of like, you know, bespoke niche stuff. They only have about 6% of the market. So you're talking of sort of 70, 70, 75 percent of the business is outside of new build it's the new build which is the beam the, the weaker area uh but uh imports have also which is what where large competition have also uh decreased and um and so actually even though they nudge down their forecast for 2020 uh, for this year 2024 the actual shares went up and let me just put the, the share price on so They've done remarkably well. The biggest competitors, and there's this this three major manufacturers in the UK. Um, there's um, Ipstock, Fortera, and Werneberg, and they own about sort of eighty percent of the market. But um, Michael say Michael must have ran about sort of. Uh, let me just put it up now. I've got it up. <clears throat> um, there we go. You can see that, yeah. John, you can see yeah, the chart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Chart. And I mean, the shares, even though they've even though they've moved up, are, are, are still only trading at around about well ten times PE, and they've got eleven million pounds of uh, of cash as well. And I just think this is a perfect one, just to lock, lock in, hold. <clears throat> I own it. I think you own the um, um, uh, was it Angler Direct as well and BT. And uh, I'm just going to hold it, and uh, I've held it for you know I've had I've had it many a time in the past as well. Um, and I just think, you know, at some point in time, you're probably going to see consolidation. But even if you don't, then there's, there's plenty of upside because uh, this one should trade at roughly around about eight times EBITDA. And um, I've got a price, to, well, I've got a fair value of about, I think it's 165, uh, whereas I think can accord are about uh, 180 or something like that. So um, there's, I think there's plenty of upside. Um, I don't know what you think of the building product sector, John. I mean, I wouldn't have touched it for a while. <laughs> Just as you say that, you know, the housing, um, the house building sector has been has been, you know, horrendous, and we've we've seen some horrible numbers coming from from some of the larger house builders. Uh, you know, over the past year or so, you know, you've seen a significant reduction in house building output. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, as, as you say, you know, you you don't want to be you know focused on you don't want to be invested in anything that's that's going to see their own volumes fall as a result of that. Um, you know, the, the Mitchell Merch case case does make sense you know you look around here in Suffolk where we have lots of sort of you know historic buildings there is a lot of work going on there is yeah. a lot of work going on and, and you know these these buildings have to be restored sympathetically uh as as you've alluded to and um, there's a lot of sort of infrastructure projects that are, are happening um you know in, in a sort of w- wider area so so yeah I, I, it, it makes sense but you know I I, I think it's very it's, it's cyclical and you know we, we've been through a uh a, a down cycle um, what we might see, you know, we've got an election coming up. There's going to be some significant, significant commitments to housing output. You know, we, we, we're nowhere near our, our housing targets. You know, we, I think we need 300,000 homes a year. Mm. Um, so, so you can see there being some, some, some real sort of uh, political impetus behind, behind that sector. And that will in turn flow through to, to the building product sector. Um, what I like in ha- housing construction is the, the partnership model. So uh, Vistry was the first, first company to go down this route. Uh, and it's really working in conjunction with sort of local authorities to build uh, much needed social social accommodation. I think this is something we'll see a lot more of. And, uh, and that, I think, will really, really drive the sector. And as uh, in turn, the building materials sector will will follow. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, know which comes, I know which comes first, the house builders or the, or the building materials. One or the other is going to move first. I don't know which one it is. Well, it's interesting the share price the house builders already have, and Vistri mm. has very, but the, but the house build, but the building products haven't yet. And I think that's it's going to yeah. come. There you go. So it will come. It will follow. Yeah. Okay. Well, one uh, one 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 question that uh, we've, we've come in is just in terms of sort of like you know that that um, sort of the, the, you know the logic etc of moving. You normally, stock markets move ahead of the economy, but in the small cap sector, and we've seen that in the large cap, but in the in the small cap, it actually <laughs> hasn't moved at all. How do you sort of square that? Because it's really weird, isn't it? Because then he, he's got you know, the, the point is, is is well made in terms of you normally expect the, the stock market to lead the economy by six months, but in the small cap, it's still dire. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the UK market has been it's a bit of an outlier, and you know, in terms of sort of uh, stock market theory, um, you know, it's 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 a, a pariah market for various reasons. <laughs> uh, you know, we've seen massive outflows 
massive outflows um you know there's been you know significant risk off and obviously that's going to hurt smaller companies more more than larger ones but but the uk generally is not has not been an, an attractive investment destination for some time um yeah. you know and that's and that's felt more keenly at the bottom end of the market it's been you know we, 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 i did a um an interview with a guy called neil wilson who works at a company called finalto there's po- podcasts up on our site but over leverage and we, we talk about what's wrong with the uk market um, you know, and there's there's sort of lots of efforts afoot to try and you know create some stimulus that that will actually attract investment to the UK, and to, including you know talk of a British ISA, for example. Um, so so yeah, I, I mean it's just it's pure outflows. Mm. It's just it's just people don't want to put their money in the market at the moment. And that's be temporary though, should But at some point that's that's going to change. We would hope so. You would think so. You know, there is sort of mean reversion is a powerful force in in stock markets, but. But but what will change it? And you know, there, there, what what's really been problematic for the UK is that you know there, there is one big trade that the, the rest, of, and it's not just the UK that suffers, but the UK has felt it you know worse than others, is that the big trade that nobody's wanted to miss out on is the Magnificent Seven. So so much money has been sucked out of everything to to to, to go into those stocks, uh, which have performed magnificently. That 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 you know that, that that's where the trade is. That's been the the, the trade. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're invested in in the Magnificent Seven, you, you obviously don't have capital to, to allocate elsewhere. So, as, so, as, so it's as, been problematic. Has passives been a, p- a part of that as well? It, because it, it would be, yeah, because it's the same principle. You know, if you're if you're in a FTSE All World Index, that's money essentially flowing into big big tech, um, which is you know such makes up such a huge proportion of global markets. Um, so yeah, I would say passives have been part of that, uh, and uh, and I say that FOMO trade on on big tech. Mm. Well, that must be very good for your um, new growth company investor service for next month, isn't it? Because if, you, if, if all the money's been running to one direction yeah. indiscriminately, it's been running away from small caps. And I mean, there must be lots and lots of good value. Something to look forward uh, to. Anyway. I do. I do think there is a hell of a lot of value out there. It's just, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's, it's, it's been a long time coming that value. We, we thought we saw a glimpse of it yeah, not that long ago, that, that value had started to, to perform again. Um, really, that was sort of during the, the sort of the beginnings of the inflationary crisis and the, and the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, where, where you know, the, the big, deep value stocks in the UK and, you, you know, you're talking about your shells and, and the banks and, you know, start, started to perform. So it seemed for a bit like value was, mm. was, was the place to be. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, you know, as infl- inflation rose and interest rates rose, the small cap world was not the place to be. You know, the, the, the ones with the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the longer uh, discounted cash flow problem. Um, so, 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 yeah, but, but, you know, there's deep value in small caps now. And, uh, but, but as I say, it's just one of those it's an elusive performance from, from, from value as a strategy. Yeah. Okay, well, I look forward to hearing what you what you're going to be picking anyway. Because mm. say lots of one 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 stock that I know you own is um, is ten lifestyle has actually had a bit of sort of like capital sucked out of it by the that exact trend. Let me put yeah. the chart up. Can you give us your latest view on this one because it's effectively does sort of concierge services for well healed people in the um, in the banks and their yeah, customers yeah. and stuff like that. And we'll just talk through its USP, what it does. It's a nice company. So, you know, it basically works with uh, sort of wealth managers, high-end banks um, to provide, as you say, lifestyle services, concierge services, you know, travel, uh, event tickets, that kind of stuff, experience, food experiences, holidays, um, you know, to to their customers. So it's sort of like, you know, it's like, a, you know, we get a NatWest premium account, you might get some things like phone insurance chucked in, but it's like kind of that. Uh, on a sort of different level, on steroids, absolutely, yeah. So, so you know, and it's 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 basically a business that you know it's it's all about having the the right contacts in the industry to be able to offer to be able to to get these things. So, so that you know, these these kind of hard to hard to get things. I think like Glastonbury tickets, you know, impossible to get if uh, if you don't you know jump on the queue at the beginning. But but Ten has put a network in place, so it, it, it has access to these kind of tickets and event tickets, yeah, Wimbledon Centre Court tickets. You know, imagine how hard they are to get. Um, and 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 it's a you know banks sign up because this is a great attraction for their for potential clients of theirs, yeah. uh, potential customers um, who 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 then you know say access these services through their accounts. Um, so I just recently signed a deal with big uh, Saudi Arabian. Uh, bank, you know, this is the kind of level we're talking about, the kind of wealth we're talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a really nice, a really nice little company. It's, it's hit that critical mass, that point of critical mass. 
And, and I think we can expect, you know, profits to start really growing, growing from here. The, the groundwork has been laid over many years and, 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 and you know, it's got a, a very decent customer base, a very strong network of, of, of partners who, 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 you know, whose, whose products it, it provides through these, through these banking uh, arrangements and, and the growth will, will come from here. Where's the but where's the growth? Is it is, is the growth coming from essentially a, a new market? You're effectively re- on selling. You've, you've got some high profile clients, you mm. banks, etc. And then it's convincing other effectively big corporates that yeah. this service is useful for them, and therefore that. So it's it's, it's basically a, a a TAM which is increasing in size because more people see the benefits of using these these services. Yeah, you'd be basically, you know, it's it's new ar- arrangements with with you know uh, high level arrangements with with banking uh, partners, customers, and also then uh, you know encouraging uh, th- those those banking customers to use the service to become uh, what what um, so nicely calls active members. So if you actually look at uh, the, the active member numbers, they're up thirteen percent over the year. Right, so uh, okay. three hundred fifty six thousand. So so you know you, it's it's a combination of two things. Right. Okay, good. Well, let's move to the um, other end of the spectrum. Is it with H and T, H and T, which mm. I think is the UK's biggest pawnbroker, which it again is. you own. So you've got a sort of like you've got a pro cycle play in uh, in Ted Lifestyle, and you've got a counter cycle in the uh, in H and T. I don't, I don't, take, I don't take think, take think this Ted Lifestyle is cyclical. I don't think that's a cyclical business. I, I, you know, I think the, the wealthy are wealthy. They spend, you know, through the ups and downs of uh, of, of economic cycles. Um, Bur- Burberry, you know. Burberry, Diageo have definitely had issues. Yeah, no, no, no but you, you will. But you, you've actually seen a lot of, you know, shift. The, 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 the reason you're seeing a lot of the issues in sort of the the the, the luxury good space is actually a shift from uh, spending on stuff. So you know, spending on that 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 Burberry handbag, or you know, spending on a high end bottle of spirits, or spending on a on a on a Rolex to into experiences. So the money is shifting uh, around the economy. So, so they're still spending; they're just spending somewhere else. Right. So, you know, and, and and this is sort of pent up demand from uh, f- from obviously, you know, a few years of, of, of very disruptive tra- travel plans. Right. Um, okay. Okay. So, good. Do yeah. So, 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 but so H and H- 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 T is is the well is a is a counter cyclical play. More, mm, it's, mm. its pledge book has gone really well, hasn't it? The, the pledge book is growing. You know, really growing very, very, very strongly. Yeah, net asset value in the business is growing very strongly. Um, I mean, it did sort of warn uh, earlier in the year, and it's basically um, the, the result of uh, some weakness in the retail business. So obviously, you know, when someone brings in a watch uh, to, to as, a, as a you know pledge uh, and and doesn't come back, uh, they they sell it. But but the retail business has has been weak. Um, I mean, you know, we've and we've seen this <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> across the sector. Watches of Switzerland uh, have, have obviously have performed very badly. Um, and but in their case, it's as much a result of you know, problems with supply, um, but but uh, as it is demand. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's 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 been tough. But but in terms of you know what H and T is, which is a, a you know a means for uh, people to you know, obtain small loans, and you know this is you know in an economy like ours, this is you know important. Um, there are very few sources of of of, uh, of credit available for you know large swathes of society, especially now your sort of payday lenders have have largely disappeared. So agency is in a very good position uh, mm. to, to to really you know meet that meet that need. Um, it's also uh, I bought a company recently, um, you know, so a, a pledge book pawn book of a company called Max Crop Securities, which is in uh, Ilford, uh, Gants Hill, place I know well. You grew up there. Um, Are you a customer of H and T? No, I'm not. Um, but Max Crop takes me. It's more SME lending, so large, larger scale loans. Um, and again, yeah. you know, financing small businesses um, is is very neat, very important. It was. Uh, there have been very, very, you know, serious difficulties for small businesses to raise finance. Uh, there is a company that you know I should mention in that in that regard, which is Time Finance, which has done you know a cracking yeah. job uh, of, of of tapping into that market. Um, one I brought up on a stock screen ages ago and didn't buy. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots um, of FOMO but, around nowadays. Oh well, yeah, you know, easy come, easy no, go. I, but, um, I, I would I would totally agree with you on that. I think H and T. I mean, it's still trade. Well, it trades at less than seven times PE mm. and. Um, you know, I mean, it's got a decent balance. It's got a good balance sheet, and it 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 sort of, as you say, it should be able to give you a bit of 
hedging in your portfolio if the economy does turn south badly it's doing well anyway at the moment but even even if it did turn south then um, it would give you that extra hedge i guess yeah it's just, it's just a nice little business really uh, nice little business nice big business now yeah. um and i think again there's there's room for, for expansion there's room, yeah. a bit of room for consolidation as well you know you usually have other porn broke play rams this is another one that springs to mind yeah. also you know similar but smaller um yeah. and similarly cheap um yeah. And the other thing they do is, you know, foreign exchange. So, um, you know, again, they were sort of, there is the, they are a beneficiary indirectly of that that shift in spending towards uh, towards travel and experiences. Yeah, got a got a quick comment from um, uh, Fredo three hundred says, uh, "Cracking job there, John." So um, he, he he likes your comments and and your shirt, I think, as well. But uh, in terms of portfolio construction. Um, how do you sort of like manage that with the risk and stuff, big caps, small caps, and also sort of, you know, your dividend income, just just quickly, broadly? I don't, to be honest, I just buy companies that I like at the moment. It's not. It's not <laughs> that, is, that, is a, that is a straight and as honest an answer I've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like, I, you know, and, and, and so I like, you know, I buy things that I, I think, you know, off represent good value. And, you know, it's not to say they always, they always do because mm. we'll come onto one that has performed badly. But I like the company. There are aspects of a company that I like. I like, you know, generally speaking, when companies doing a company is doing something that I think is is good. Um, but but you know, it says yeah, construction. I, I I don't pay. I don't pay a huge amount of thought. I mean, it's not a big enough portfolio to worry substantially about asset allocation and I, as i say i do get that through through other investments that i hold um this this is more a sort of thing this is a portfolio i i run uh for for the fun of of investing um and you know there's i mean there's there's other things i i, I keep my own um but yeah there's uh, there's no need to, to really worry about asset allocation risk management yeah. of this thing uh no I, mean, I have i have sold stuff in the past you know i've only ever sold one stock actually <laughs> Have you? <laughs> Not BT. <laughs> no, I sold Sumero at a very large loss. Um, concrete leveling, um, mainly because I really couldn't see where the way the way back for that, and I, and I, it's been proven correct that that's those shares I've been languishing for some time. Yeah, might dip back in at some point. Yeah, well, 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 well sold. Um, but mm. I do. It's an important highlight I do, to, to investors. A, a, an important attribute to be a good stock picker and to be a long term is, as you said, to take. You know, it's, it's got to be fun. I e you enjoy it, and 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 that means you you put your. It's it's important to have skin in the game. But there's another saying: it's important to have soul in the game. And I think you know, I say highlight. If you've got somebody like John who who puts all his efforts and he, he does it because he enjoys it, then uh, you know you hopefully get better outcomes and and, and lasting. But um, anyway, we'll move on. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's another stock that I like to highlight to investors um, is um, is Speedy Hire in the sort of like um, it's, it basically does plan hire for construction firms, house building and infrastructure and the shares in the whole sector have done absolutely terrible it came out with a profit warning uh, just before christmas it actually been hit by some warmer weather um, because it usually hires out quite a lot of um, heating um, equipment to to builders and to constructors and because it was so warm they didn't need it um so uh, that, that that the utilization rates on that part of the business didn't do so well um, and also, you know, some of the probably the, the wetter weather also didn't help in terms of construction signs. But what I like about it, I mean, it just is it's just frankly too cheap. It's as good to me. It's a good, solid recovery play. It's got a decent balance sheet. Um, it's got, you know, it's sort of like just over one times um, net debt to EBITDA is just over one times. It trades at about five and a half times P.E. It trades at sort of less less than three times EBITDA. And um I mean, basically, if you just look at it on a net tangible assets, you strip out its in, its intangibles. It's got a, it's got a you know net tangible assets is about thirty four p shares today are trading at twenty five, and um, I mean, just frankly, it's too low. If you used it to modest four times EBITDA multiple, you get to you know sixty p. And if you use a traditional you know industry standard of six times EBITDA, you get to a pound. And Liberum have got sort of 54p as a target price. Yes, obviously, house building is is weak at the moment. But frankly, that will turn and people will do more DIY. And uh, I just think this has just been left dead and buried. And I, I, for somebody who wants a solid share, in my view, because there aren't that many, there's this, there's, there's, there's Speedy Hire, there's um, <clears throat> HSS and there's VP and uh, Ashdead have also got there's some belt division in the UK as well. So there aren't that many big players of scale. 
and they're doing some quite interesting things, Speedy High. They've got an ag agreement with um, um, B&Q <clears throat> to help their distribution, and they've also got one into new sort of like uh, electrification products or hydrogen products with um, AFC. So they're doing some quite interesting things, and they're certainly helping the planet in terms of r moving their equipment to more electric-based rather than uh, sort of, you know, sort of diesel-based or uh, petrol-based. I don't know if you've ever had a look at this one, um, John. It, it just seems mispriced to me. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, it's um, it's probably you know, in the same sort of vein as, as the building materials. Uh, yes, sector. it is. You know, you sort of you you will see a recovery. It's very very cyclical. Uh, that recovery will come at some point. And you know, as long as it can manage the you know the down the down periods, the quiet periods, then then you know it should be in a decent position to benefit when the up upswing comes, when the up cycle yeah. comes. Um, I mean, it's looking. At, I mean, just looking at it now, big big fat dividend. On this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, they may have to. I mean, if, even if they have to halve it, it's still not a you know massive problem. Mm, mm. So you know, again, it's going to be it's a tough a tough year, but but that's where you you know you'll find you'll find value in, in, yeah. in tough times. But but you know, it's, it's sort of and, and, and Ashton is the same. It's, it's it's been a great company over the long term, but you know, you look at the last couple of years, it's been horrendous. Um, we had a big sell off in twenty one. It then it it's bounced back, and and the same will happen here. Um, you know, people don't don't stop building things. No, and I think that if you look, if you look sort of like over the secular growth, I mean, you, you just look at sort of the infrastructure projects, which is probably mm. at least a third, if not forty percent, of the business. You've got still HS two. Obviously, they've cancelled the northern side, but they've still got the south side. Is it's, it's got years of. Stuff oh, it's a hell of a hell of a project. That I drove past, saw it for the first time when we were yeah. on our way to well, Marlow. Like my neck of the woods in Birmingham. Yeah, it's it's quite an extraordinary thing. You know, some of the some of the viaducts they've had to build, some of the tunnels that they've had to dig. I mean, it's just it's an, it's an engineering product to be a uh, product uh, product project to behold. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. Of, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure required in this country. A yeah, lot. I mean, you've, got, you've, got, you've got size. You've got size. We'll see. Yeah. Around the corners of me. You've got the new nuclear, which is the small form. You've got energy transition to, mm -hmm. you know, to hydrogen, and then you've got all the offshore wind. So when you took it, when you look at it through that lens of sort of like big infrastructure, I mean, these are just like mega decades, multi, multi yeah. tens of billions. Then these are one of the guys who are going to do it. And if oh, we're, we're, just... where do you stop? You know, we, we've we've got a load of schools that are, you know need need rebuilding. We've got hospitals that need you know mm. the significant you know physical infrastructure investment in them. So so yeah, I I think infrastructure is a good play, and um, you know there's lots of companies that benefit from that. Uh, but but you know indirectly, speedy hire will, should should be a beneficiary of what I suspect will be the sort of upswing in the infrastructure cycle. And and again, it's sort of that that correlates with the political cycle, and we have a general election some some point this year. Yeah. OK, well, let's move to another stock. Well, it's a stock that we both like, but you own, I don't, and has done rippingly war for, well for you, is HVivo, really? which, which is a sort of like, to, I think it's a bit of a picks and shovels play on sort of like uh, uh, doing challenge trials for new uh, vaccines yes. and infectious sort of like, you know, uh, fire, biopharma. Should you take us through this one? Because it really has performed tremendously over the last two or three years yeah it's fabulous business and you know i i, I so i had was lucky enough to speak to, to mo khan the chief exec a few times and you know the more i spoke to him the more i thought you know this is this is a serious business yeah um you know again it was sort of on the cusp of uh of, of profitability but it but it's hit that it's way it's past it's past that point and now it's just you know from here it's uh the only way is up um as you say you know it manages these these sort of human it produces these human challenge models which which basically help uh companies um understand the efficacy uh of uh of the drugs that they're trying to produce and and you know sort of predictive predictiveness in that um so it really helps companies biotechs and, and biopharmas get get drugs to the market you know more effectively uh and that's you know improves the cost and it improves the the kind of potential um the, the outcomes of clinical trials which which you know in the past have been prone to prone to failure you have very difficult Things. Does anybody and, else do this, John? Or is it just you? No, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they do. They have another division which does sort of, uh, you know, uh, laboratory services, which it, which does have competitors. But the human challenge trial thing, I think, is is fairly unique. Um, they they uh, they're expanding the portfolio of, of of diseases that they they look at. And, you know, sort of largely respiratory uh, diseases. Uh, and uh, and the range of customers they're working with. So you know, they picked up business in Asia Pacific. You know, they get they get a lot of repeat business. From from, uh, from large pharma groups that they're working with, um, you know the order book is oh, we got ninety percent of twenty fourth revenue in the bag yeah. already. I, I mean, understand Pfizer's you know, a big customer of it. 
Yeah, they don't. They never really talk specifically about their customers, but you would imagine, you know, there are there are very few large names that won't be working with HBO uh, somewhere along the line. And but there is more to go. Um, you know, there's, there there are seriously, uh, you know, unmet needs in in, 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 in respiratory disease. Are you know RSV um, being being one of them? Um, so so you know you've got this you've got this company which, as you, as you rightly point out, it's picks and shovels. It's there. You know, with, it, it, without the risk of, of of drug development that comes with drug development, risk huge rewards, but you know, risky as well when when drugs don't make it through. Um, HBO sort of you know benefits either way, but as it happens, it's helping companies you know as I say improve the outcome, uh, improve the the likelihood that, that the drugs they're developing will make it through clinical trials. Um, yeah. It's it's fantastic business. They're expanding their their, their capacity, so they've uh, taken some space down in Canary Wharf, uh, which they're turning into. What they call flu camp, which is where where volunteers can go along and <laughs> be, um, be infected, so that they can be um, be analysed. That you know, they say this drug can be analysed, um, and they'll, they'll basically have it will be a one stop shop in there. It will be sort of a lab capacity in there as well. Funny enough, in the budget, uh, I don't, this might have gone unnoticed, um, but. But there was a, a mention that, that the government is very keen to, to turn Canary Wharf into a, a life sciences hub um, because, actually, yes. as we know, certain yeah, some banks are moving out of Canary Wharf now. So Canary Wharf is going to go a bit of a transition uh, and the, the transition is towards life sciences and HVO is, is kind of leading the pack there. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. I guess that given the shares have tripled over the past sort of like, um, what, years or so would there be ever point your top slice or this is really a case of oh, running winners because the market's keep adding, massive keep adding yeah <laughs> and i've added to this a couple of times um you know i don't want to get too far ahead. i don't want to go to, too bonkers you know but but i i i'm i'm in no hurry to sell any of this at the moment and as as, uh, as i say i would i would add rather than sell you know when we look at forecast p20 which for a growth company like this is it's just that seems very, very, very cheap. Mm. Um, it's paying a dividend. You know, it's it's uh, a growth company paying a dividend. For 55% earnings growth for next year. All its revenues are in the bag, uh, pretty much, for 2024. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's... And, and I really, as I say, I really rate, rate Mo, the, the, the chief exec. He's a force of nature, is he? He's, he's, a, he's incredibly, incredibly good. Incredibly yeah. switched on. Yeah. Good. No, I would agree. I don't. I don't think there's any reason to uh, to 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 put the to push the shell button on that one. I think it's just mm. got it's got rocket boosters and it seems to have the market itself. So uh, it's sold out. You're crazy to 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 take unless you've got an unbelievable opportunity elsewhere. But that seems to be plenty um, to go. Okay. This is by far, far and away the best stock in my portfolio performance yeah. wise. Well, hey, I wish I'd had I wish I'd three bagged in uh, eighteen months. So well done. I didn't quite do that well. I know another one in the healthcare sector. I just like to highlight to investors. I don't own it. Is Advanced Medical Solutions. So let me just um, get the uh, price up, the share price. And the reason why I like it, it's got really a lot of unique technology in wound care. So it basically does sort of things like uh, you know adhesives and glues, and it does stitches and. Uh, ways of when, when people are into like in hospital and stuff it helps accelerate that whole healing process etc and coagulants and this sort of stuff on 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 deep wounds um and uh it, it it stumbled just recently over the last 18 months it had a distribution uh, issue out in the states that reduced some of its sales volumes last year but what's really sort of caught my eye is that the, the prices you know the shares have come down into reasonable sort of value territory uh, and it's just bought a region of transformational acquisition of, of Peter's surgical about two weeks ago. And um, it's a perfect, it's an absolute, you know, sort of like great fit for the business in terms of product distribution, geographical spread, et cetera. And uh, I don't think the market's really seen what this, what this means. And I think it could really accelerate the EPS growth, not only through top line and getting back to sort of like high single digits, maybe even low digits or get organic growth, you know, volume and, and pricing um, on the top line, but also improve the uh, the profit margins. And the profit margins are, are still good. They're about 17% forecast for this year for EBIT. But I think you'll get well above 20% once you've integrated this bit, these two businesses together. Um, and just running the numbers, I mean, I know that the shares have sort of like, you know, just flat lines since it, et cetera. Um, but I mean, you've got you've got new miss at a target price of two fifty. But if you just, even if you put a sort of like just you don't put any growth into it and just put a normal sort of twenty twenty one percent EBIT margins on it, then you get to sort of like forty five million of EBIT for you know sort of like in a year's time. You put a fifteen times 
EBIT multiple on that, you get £2.80. And so I would say for a really rock solid, high IPR rich healthcare stock, that's got great distribution across the Western world, particularly in Europe and the States and stuff. I don't think you can go too far wrong with this one. And to be honest, I, I, I'll be not surprised if Smith and Nephew bought these because they want to they want to boost up their their you know wound healing business. And this is this is going to have joint revenue of over two hundred twenty million pounds. So uh, mm. looks a high quality stock trading and not really seen really that much. You know, not really sort of you know picked up by investors yet. What's your view? Looks nice. I'm just looking at the numbers now. Uh, so uh, I mean, it seems I presume it spent a large chunk of. I mean, it's had a lot of cash I'm sure, i presume a lot of that is going to go into this acquisition yeah it, they, the, the the sort of pro forma ebit to, net debt to ebitda after the acquisition is about 1.5 which is mm. absolutely fine because these are this is recurring revenue streams and it will come down rapidly because it's a massive cash generator yeah, this. it looks hugely cash generated looking at looking at these these forecasts that i'm looking at uh you know the net net borrowing was was forecast to or net cash rather was you know by around 20 million a year so yeah. you know, big big chunks of cash coming into the business. Yeah, lots of green on the uh, share pad summary uh, page. Oh, is there? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that so, a good sign or a bad sign? That's green. A good sign. Green is good. Red is bad. Oh, okay, uh, right. so so yeah, no, you know, really decent, decent earnings growth, decent, decent dividend. No, yeah. not not huge, but you know, we, we, we like dividend growers as much as you know the ones that pay a large and chunky dividend. Yeah, uh, decent returns on capital, decent margins. Yeah, like, yeah, you might be right. Smith and nephew needs to do something. That's been a, a serial disappointer. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's another one I quite like actually as a mm. as a lead version play. But um, let's not discuss that one. Let's go to an, a smaller one actually that you own is um, is Paul Beg Farmer, which I think was a spin out from uh, Open Orphan. In fact, I it think was. It was, yeah, it was. another one which, yeah, which came, is... came out, of, but basically Open Orphan, which was HV as was, yeah. and, and yeah. Paul Beg was spun out of that. Paul Beg is the drug discovery side of things. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's, I, I, I've never really. It's a sector that I've always been wary of because of the, you know, the high risk of failure attached to, uh, uh, you know, drug drug development. Um, but but they, I, I feel that Paul Beg is doing something slightly different. Again, I spoke to the chief exec Jeremy Skillingson quite a few times. Uh, impressive guy. Um, they're using, you know, they're using uh, HVO's models, you know, mm -hmm. human challenge models to, to 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 expedite their drug discovery process. They're using AI. Which is a big trend in healthcare. You know, this yeah. is this is analysing data in ways that could just simply not be done in the past, and you know that 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 really does you know reduce the risk of of, of failure of a clinical trial failure significantly. Uh, again, meeting un, unmet needs, um, so you know respiratory illnesses. They're, they're working with um, one one of the, the applications they found for their lead drugs, P P O L B zero zero one, is mm. uh, in cancer care. So you're getting sort of a lot of modern, and I know this is an area that you look at, Paul, uh, yeah. through, through some other companies, but that you're getting a lot of sort of modern cancer treatments, CAR T uh, therapies, yeah. um, uh, you know, immunotherapies. Um, but, but great, you know, we, these are hugely effective uh, at treating cancer, but they come with, with quite a significant side effect. It's called a cytokine release storm. Yes. Um, and what Paul Beg has realised is that that actually it's 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 drug can 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 really. Um, you know, it, basically, it's preventative for the cytokine release storm potentially, and this is huge because you know CAR T therapies, the th immunotherapies, is, is is the growth area of cancer, uh, and, and and Paul Berg is in the right place with a potential companion therapy for that, which which actually makes the whole market work. The whole car, you know, at the moment it's very hard to administer. You've got to be in hospital uh, or a very specialist cancer centre to have these uh, immunotherapies in case you suffer, uh, you know, a serious life threatening cytokine release storm. Um, Paul Beggs potentially broaders the market uh, means that it, this 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 you know cutting edge cancer care uh, therapy can be delivered uh, elsewhere. Mm. Uh, and there are many other things that it's doing as well. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, no, again, I could just, fascinating company. When you were just when you were just talking about it, I was just thinking that scenario. It's going to come, isn't it? At some point, that we're going to get another variety of COVID or airborne sort mm, of like you know mm. bacteria that we're not going to have a vaccine immediately. We'll be able to sort it later on. But in that interim period, rather than actually locking everybody down, if if Paul Beg actually have a, a drug out there that helps people get through, you know, if you, if you turn the clock back four years ago, the biggest debt killer of, of you know, from, from COVID was actually um, psych, psycho, psycho storm, wasn't it? it was yeah, basically psycho without immuno reaction. 
and mm. if and, and if you have a drug that actually can help people get through the hospital then um these these guys that would have been a perfect position and it's a matter of when not if we get yeah. something like that again and unfortunately that's the reality of the situation does, does feel that way and this is today's modern world but um yeah so i think you know again paul Beck's in the right place this is removing is the rare disease space as well which is you know very very uh very lucrative um it's brought team on board from uh from a company oh god oh well, amrit farmer amrit thank you paul um so yeah, Amrit was again. It was it's, it, there is a guy who sits behind this, Kahal Friel, um, mm. who, who's uh, you know, he's he's brought many companies to the market and 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 was very successful with Amrit, and he's brought that team across into into uh, into Pullbeg. So you know, it's, I say it's, it's a sector which I think is is one that investors need to navigate cautiously. But I, I feel this is this is a company that has has all the right ingredients to be extremely successful. Mm. Well, I'll give you a bit of good news on Amrit Farmer. The guys are first class. They've done it. They did a brilliant mm. job. And and what I would say, expect Paul Beg to be buying stuff, you know, other businesses, other 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 target candidates, or even the, probably stuff that's actually in in the outside the clinic, actually in commercial development as well, or very close to it, because uh, they really did a brilliant job, and they they know how to how to work those businesses. So uh, yeah. I think uh, my my instinct would be. There's going to be lots of really good news flow. You wouldn't get a team that capable going into a small, a bought smaller business like Paul Beg unless they saw huge opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, agreed. Yeah, agreed. Okay, good. We've had another question uh, for you. Here. It's from um, from uh, Fredo again. He's asking about um, Norban Broadbent, the recruiter. I don't know if you know about. It. I think it does mainly, if my member rightly, it does mainly sort of executive search. Yeah. So it's it's your it's your 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 neck of the woods there, John. Not not your blue collar, and this is your your, your big hitters like you. Yes, thanks, Paul. Uh, I do. I, I recruit recruitment. Is, I haven't looked at this company very much. Uh, I've 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 tended to avoid. I've never really liked recruitment as a sector. Um, again, you know, it seems it seems very cyclical. Uh, the specialists tend to do better. So, mm. you know, where, you, where you've got companies that have had a specialist, specialism in something like STEM, you know, science, mm. technology, engineering, medicine, they've tended to be a bit more resilient than sort of more general recruitment, like, you know, Hayes, for example. Um, Nor Royal Bent Executive Search, I mean, uh, I, I, sorry, I haven't looked at the numbers. Uh, I know they had, they had some news out this week, didn't they? Yeah, I think the shares went up. <clears throat> I mean, my, my, into, results, my take... Yeah. My my take on Norman Broadbent, I mean, basically, wow. is it it's well, it's basically got a decent brand and it'll be bought out by somebody. It's run by a pretty good exec chairman, I think. Mm. I know Judith McKenzie owns some shares in it, and she's not stupid. And uh, although it's quite a small business, I, I don't, I'm not sure what the market cap is, but it's uh, very small, six million. Yeah, six I, I, million. I, my my instinct is that. Once the sort of the um, you know the dial changes in terms of here was the uh, there's the sales okay well yeah it's basically trade well uh, that's the historical sales it only goes to 2022 um, but um, this will have a lot of operating leverage and um, yeah if the market turns mm. it's going to be tough it's just it's just got to get through I don't know how much debt it is it's just got to get through the next t- twelve months which will be tough for recruitment yeah but, I mean you can see it in those numbers there though it's sort of net sales you know they, they, they've dipped. Yeah, or rising again, you know. So you see the cyclicality inherent in in this kind of company, um, yeah. which is, I say, which is why it's a sex I've, I've I've never really liked. Um, but who's to say that you know that, that this you know isn't a company that that has 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 a you know some sig- significant recovery prospects ahead of it? I mean, look at the revenue growth. Yeah, uh, net free income up forty four percent in uh, in its final results last year, and that's that's a pretty impressive impressive performance, albeit from a weak year. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's move to a slightly again a bigger firm. You've probably held for some time. Unilever. Now, this yeah. is a, com- a company I know quite well because I used I, I <laughs> that was my first job after graduation. Unilever. So all things brand, basically personal and uh, personal products. And it's just it's, it's just announced. It's had, a, it's had a new CEO who came in. And he's been under a lot of pressure basically to rationalise its SKUs, its product line, uh, improve the top line growth, improve the margins and uh, and really get this business growing a, a bit like um, uh, P&G and, uh, you know, other big consumer good companies. Mm. Um, but uh, and so one of its one of his ideas is to chop a lot of people out of the business, take out middle management and also to demerge or spin out its ice cream business. So uh, what's your views latest on this one? It's been a good performer for me, actually, strangely. 
Yeah, but you know, I think you you kind of alluded when when we were speaking before. It's a sort of recovery plan, and it kind of is. I mean, they 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 almost got bought a few years ago, if you remember. Yes, they did. And, yeah, and, yeah, you're um, right. Good point. Good spot. And then they. Uh, they had to, to you know, mount quite a robust defence, uh, and, and that defence is basically we will turn this business around. So, uh, you know, and it wasn't not a turnaround from you know a disaster, but but really sort of just just really lacklustre growth. Mm. Um, this whole industry is a funny industry. I mean, it's always everyone's always selling something to someone else. It's always it's just always moving around, you know, brands, <laughs> brands moving around. So so you know, it, it's. It makes sense to spin out the ice cream business, which which had been you know a good performer, probably then not such a good performer. Um, but but yeah, what why not? This is you know GSK has done it with with its um you know its personal care division, uh, Haley on. Um, you know, so this is this is the way the emergers create value. So good, mm. excellent. The shares about five percent on this news, um, which was great. But I like you know it pays a nice dividend. I, I, I you know got no problems hanging on to this one. Um, the, uh, the the thing that attracts him is this. I was, it was going back some time now. I was ch- chatting to um, a guy who you may know called Nick Chain. Yes. Who runs uh, one of the I do, yeah. best known invest, investment trusts, the Finsbury Growth and Income Investment Trust. And I was sort of probing him about, you know, why why did you hold Junior Lee? You know, it's just, it's just, this is not a really a growth company. You know, wh- wh- where does it... And, and he likes baggers. He likes companies. He calls them baggers, you know, that that, that can can double and double again mm-hmm. and double again. How can Unilever double from here? It's absolutely gigantic. Well, that's just thirty years. Yeah. So you can see you can see how it does actually. <laughs> yeah, precisely, <laughs> precisely. So so you know it's sort of like okay. Well, I take the point. Now, if you've got two slightly smaller companies, mm. you know, law or large numbers suggest that they could you know more easily double than yeah. than, than another than, than, than the sort of larger combined group. And and that focus does tend to help companies. Mm. Um, but the thing that Nick, Nick Train pointed out to me that I thought was most interesting is that, that Unilever actually holds a stake in uh, Hindustan Lever. Yeah, uh, so majority stake. I majority think. stake. In but it's only fifty-one percent. Fifty-one percent, something like that. Okay. Or maybe it's a bit more. I can't remember off the top. Yeah, of my it could head. be a bit more. Um, but but you know, this is this is a uh, very large personal care or you know consumer goods company in one of the fastest growing markets in the world. Um, mm. You know, India is red hot at the moment as an investment destination um you know really performing strongly really business friendly environment they're growing middle class growing wealth from quite a low base so 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 you know nick train's view is we you know if they've got hindustan lever you know the, the profits accruing to unilever from hindustan lever are going to become quite substantial as mm-hmm. as india's economy performs so so and he said there is your there is your your opportunity for for the next doubling and doubling and doubling yeah and i kind of thought okay Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I, I personally wouldn't bet against Unilever. I, as I no. say, I remember participating in the um, employee share scheme, share scheme when I first joined. It was at four pounds. So after fi- after after five years, I checked uh, checked out. I think I, I bought them shares at four, and I sold at about I don't know ten or twelve or fourteen or something like that because I, I wanted to buy a house. And I made a nice profit, but the, the shares have carried on. They're forty quid, and uh, I'm with you. It's a top quality business that's been around for over a century it's got enduring and very you know lovely brands people are going to carry on using it it'll go through to, it, it survived wars it survives pandemics it ain't it, it ain't gonna have any problem with a recession because it's been through many of them yeah i mean it has it, it can move the lever on price you know you, you do hear a lot of talk around you know uh the sort of rise of the uh own label um you know the the, the fact that people will trade down to, to own label products that audi and lidl uh, the versions of things, uh, you know, will eat into Unilever's, um, uh, you know, sales growth, volume growth. It, 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 it has hit, been hit, you know, in volume terms as, as the cost of living crisis has, has hit. But, it's, but it is able to move the dial on pricing and, and you know, cost management as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, as you say, it's a very, very high quality company, which I, as, as an ex-employee, you would, you would know better than, than anyone else. Yeah, well, I've heard, I've heard that story, that old, that old yarn. The death of the brands for years. It yeah, does. It, it doesn't. It it, it it ebbs and flows. I'm it sorry. Ebbs it ebbs and flows. Yeah, make people like brands. I mean, it's, it's it's just the, it's it's the way we're wired. I used to, I used to, I used to tuck into their staff shops. It was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we used to also do a uh, a swap with Cabris, so we used to have their brands in there as well. Wow, I was I was a lot heavier back then. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. 
<laughs> anyway, right. Okay. Well, I'll move to an, uh, an edgy one here. And this is uh, sort of like in the essence of, I don't own it, but um, I'm very, uh, I'm interested in this whole sector. In fact, I'm heavily mm. weighted into international payments. Just to let people know, I own equals our Gentex and um, PayPal. Um, and uh, these would always do these do digital payments cross border, but also within companies, etc. Anyway, this this is this is a diff- this is a similar company, but but a, a different business. It's Cab Payments. Now, this has been as bad as hated a business on the stock market as you can possibly imagine. It, it was one of the few which IPO'd last year at three pounds thirty five. I think it's it raised about two hundred ninety million. Uh, pounds usually from largely selling shareholders it's actually based a place i used to live where i bought my first house sutton surrey so it's just around the corner from where i was and it's it's usp is that it does digital payments for hard to reach markets principally places like africa Mm. um, south america and the middle east and it has a big position in africa now people say okay what happened um there and and the simple reason is is that you had two things you had a devaluation devaluation of the of the nira which is in in um, uh, nigeria and more importantly it all, you also had banking intervention on the um, uh, i think it's the the west african franc which helps which 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 basically stopped all international digital payments with really well not all but a lot of them made it really tough between Cameroon Senegal and I can't remember is it Tan- I can't remember what the other one he uses is it and that's the and that's uh, quite those just those three countries are quite to at least thirty percent of their revenue so it just basically dropped off a clip they had a profit warning it's recovered a bit came out with results this week. And actually, the balance sheet is pretty good, and the growth strategy is not too bad. If you believe that emerging markets are eventually going to benefit from digital payments, like the rest of the Western world, in fact, more likely to more rely on them even more. But their customers are not me and you, John. They're actually a lot of the banks, local banks, emerging market banks, international banks in the Western world, wanting to make these, you know, sort of like payments abroad. And also, they do a lot for charities in terms of you know disaster relief, moving money for them, etc. So they've got mm. they've got a very good client base, um, and they're just to me they're just frankly too cheap. I mean they trade. I mean I know you you either say this is a value trap or a value play. I, I'm you know I'm not sure, but it, it it trades at sort of like less than seven times PE. It's got like thirty odd million of surplus capital, uh, four times EBIT DAR and four and four point five times EBIT, and it's got you know so it's a sound balance sheet. Uh, the margins are still very good, still very profitable. I just think this there'll be two things will happen. It's either <laughs> if I'm wrong, then there's there's something wrong. There's something there's a problem with their obviously balance sheet, and the, the auditors haven't picked it up, um, or there's a massive exposure somewhere. But I, I just don't believe it. Or alternatively, somebody will going to buy these, and I just think because everybody hates them, the fund managers and investors have just put it into the no touch bucket. I just think this is this is this looks like in a growth sector, in a growth market with good positions, good customers, in in, in emerging markets. So um, I think it just I'd hide. I, I'm to be absolutely clear, to be transparent, I'm not buying yet because I've got too much of my portfolio already in digital international payments, but. If equals is bought out and it releases some cash, this could well be somewhere I put some some extra money because I just think it's frankly too cheap. What's your view there, John? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not one I've looked at. I, I, I must admit, I know that you know payments has been a very hot sector, but it's it's one that I've I've sort of let, kept to one side. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I think there's a lot going on in payments mm. and too much too much for me to, to to really start trying to get my head around it um you know all the different flavors of payments uh you know uh paypal was the one that sort of really sort of struck me a couple of years ago they had an absolute shocker mm. um and you know you've, you know you're seeing you know other payment providers out there really sort of dominating this i mean this is terms of you know sort of shop payments so stripe um is, is, is has taken a lot of a lot of uh, uh you know market share there um obviously these are sort of slightly different payments companies we're talking about the more sort of you know the financial services these are b2b, B2B, B2B rather than B2B and things um and yeah i just as I say it's just i don't know enough about foreign exchange and and uh and digital payments in in that b2b area to to, to really feel comfortable investing yeah. in it you know i think you've got to do your research on stuff like this and 
Because you know, they, they say they're all slightly different flavors, and I don't know the difference between yeah. one and the other. There okay, you go. Well, I'm, being, I'm being honest. I don't understand sex. Well, I'll be I'll be licking my lips in two months' time when we uh, <laughs> when we touch base again, John. Then you, you can tell me your view on the uh, on international on international payments. Uh, yeah. Okay, we do have another question coming in uh, from uh, George Allen, and he asks about gaming realm realms, which I think basically is a mobile gaming or gambling company and it does slingo i think it is slingo bingo basically it's a okay. mobile app that um uh i think it doesn't doesn't sell itself it sells the actual software to to be like playtech but in a smaller sort of like you know software niche the shares look quite reasonable actually yeah, i think yeah. they're reasonable have you ever had a look at this one at all i haven't i haven't um but it does it does look interesting you know this is i mean Gaming is is a big big industry. Uh, it's a huge industry. You know, a lot of the UK gaming and uh, listed gaming uh, companies are really they're sort of focus on America. Um, but there's a lot of innovation going on. A lot of innovation going on in this market. Um, we we do look at some companies uh, in this, but I haven't I haven't looked at gaming realm specifically. It's certainly one I will have a look at because the numbers look look very very decent um, i think it trades at a pretty a, a single digit pe doesn't it i've got a forecast p of 18 and a half on these but but that is that is way below the sort of forecast rate of earnings growth way yeah. below it so your yeah. peg your peg which is not, a, a ratio i do like to look at yeah you know, the ratio of of, of the, the pe to, to the rate of earnings growth is 0.4 so mm. so you know that 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 valuation really, really said, I would say doesn't fully reflect the, the pace at which this company is growing. Looking at looking at the summary figures here, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I you know, I, I've briefly looked at it before, and um, it's certainly something that I would consider buying actually because I think it's a high high quality GARP company with a with a good brand, and it's yeah. the classic sort of like you know brand name for, for you know gaming etc that will go into a suite of products for the likes of mgm and yeah. you know the big casinos who need a suite of casino products so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah i can't see any reason why yeah. this won't continue doing well on a what's the market cap on it there John? 100 100 okay well i mean there you go these things if they hit it's like having a it's like having mm. a hit in gaming isn't it or hitting a, you know at the meat of the box office these things can absolutely do really well and once you get that customer loyalty at the coal face they like playing it then uh, you know you don't take it away they just stays there forever yeah yeah and uh it's uh, really cash innovative as well you know really lovely returns on, on capital lovely margins uh and the yeah. cash is the cash is pouring in um so net borrowing forecast, sorry, net cash forecast has doubled basically this year to fifteen, and then hit twenty five a year after that. So, so yeah, I mean, you know that, and that obviously means that the shares will will be even cheaper essentially yeah. uh, on a sort of EV basis. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, that looks interesting. Looks really okay, good. Well, let's switch sector to um, electrical uh, audio equipment. We've yeah. got uh, fo- focus right, which hasn't, which was obviously a bit of a darling during lockdown because everybody was playing <clears throat> the banjo and. Uh, Trying to create a bit of music, but then unfortunately, <laughs> as 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 that as, as the, the sort of the as people have already bought up new sort of like um, you know audio equipment, etc. The shares have struggled a bit. Can you take yeah. us? What's your latest on this one? Because it looks I, very I, high quality, but going through a tough patch. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's, I mean, I, I missed time my my entry into this one. That's, that's what. That's a very you know. <laughs> you got it yeah, wrong. Diplomat, got, got it badly wrong. <laughs> 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 Join the club. Join the club. I've got plenty like this. Um, but I like the company uh, for various reasons. You know, I like its products. I use its products because um, uh, I do. I wouldn't say play the banjo, but uh, but I Would do. You make music there, John. I do make a bit of music. Yeah, do electronic what type? stuff. Electronic, electronic based music. Eighties or more, more sort of like you got. Is, is this the acid sort of variety? Yeah, I call it, I call it acid house for you, yeah, old folks. Oh wow, God, I didn't realise that. <laughs> Fab. I mean, you'll, um, have to, you'll have to give us a, a performance next time. I think I think the jingle. I made the jingle for our new uh, our new branding, our new video branding. Oh, well uh, done this week. So so yeah. Um. So so so. Uh. I like the company. I like the management. I like what it does. You know. It's still, yeah. It, it was a big downgrade. It's about thirty percent, but it's still making money. Um. It it did. It has been acquiring. Um. You know. So it was. Basically, uh, a sort of a studio equipment company, but really what it's what it's acquired is a company called Martin Audio, uh, mm. which is a big sort of uh, PA speaker kind of PA. So these are the huge yeah, sound yeah, systems, huge sound systems yeah. for you know very large concerts, you know, sort of high parts festivals, that sort of thing. Um, and these these speakers are you know really the technology in them is quite incredible. 
um, because you know you, what you have at festivals is you need them to be loud enough for the crowd to hear, but not loud enough for the neighbours to hear. Um, <laughs> so, so, so basically, they sort of channel the sound the way they, they you know, they, these are inc incredibly sonically efficient. Yeah. These, these these products, and, and you know, again, the sort of festival um, market was, you know, whilst everyone was in the studio uh, during lockdown, nobody was at the festivals uh, or at concerts or whatever. So, so this is sort of giving it that balance. Uh, and I think we'll start to really see the Martin audio side of things, you know, really, really sort of drive the performance of this, of this, yeah. of this company, whilst, whilst the studio market takes a bit of time to recover. I, I suspect, you know, that this it is a fragmented market, you know, so there are lots of companies out there doing lots of similar things. Uh, you know, there are, there are, I mean, I use tools from all sorts of companies. There's a lot of German companies in this space. Mm. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so so yeah, it's not a market it has to itself, um, mm. but it is it is an acquirer. So it's building up a, a nice suite of uh, of brands, uh, as I say, some of which uh, I have and use. Um, mm. So so I like it. I like the company. I like the management. Um, you know, it's 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 very largely employee owned. So um, Phil Dudridge, who is a, a sound man for, for Led Zepp, uh, who founded the company. Uh, basically gave gave a big chunk of it to the, to the staff. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah, okay. And it just said that this isn't going to be AI, is it, the um, focus, right? Because essentially it's it's delivery of sound rather than production of, as in like, rather than creation of well, sound. Well, it's both. It's both. It's both. So, so you you know, you've got the creati the creativity side of the business, which is, you know, keyboards and, and, and software. And so, the, so there is, there is an AI potential in, in that. Um, you know, uh, and then you've, as you say, the delivery that you know the, the, the speakers uh, that you, you hear stuff through. Um, there is the potential for AI to come into this to support the creative process, uh, and I, you know, it's a point I make about about, about the you know the, the the integration of AI into many things, including, for example, journalism. Um, it, it will it will be it will be used uh, within software products within mm. within this industry, but it will certainly not. You know, I don't think you're going to get any robots making. Making music that, that, that goes to number one. Well, you probably will. you do already. You <laughs> no, do already. I'm sorry. You do already. Fans. Yeah. Stock no. Aiken and Waterman was the back in our day. Yeah, but it, it's, there's, there's a, there was a trick behind that. Um, you can you can create manufactured music, and you know you do have things really? like auto auto tune, auto tune. You know that's a big thing in the industry. You, you, know, you don't have to be able to sing to be a pop star anymore. Yeah. Um, which you know is is wizardry. It will get used, but you know as I say, you know this this. There is something, there is something lovely about the physical equipment that that, that Focusrite makes. You know the hardware, uh, and actually in a modern studio setting, it's a marriage of hardware and software that is is sort of the holy grail. Um, and and you know this is where the industry is going. Focusrite, you know, yeah, being okay. one of, being one of the players. Yeah, yeah it's been just a disa disastrous investment, but I still like it. Yeah, just to digress, the, that AI implementation. Are you putting any AI into um, into your stock picking service at all? No, no. Would you ever consider it? Because it, I don't know if you've ever, you've ever seen it. There's been a new service which is done called iFi AI, which come, which is basically partnered with Watson X, that basically proclaims that actually it can help investors augment their talents in terms of predicting whether stocks are going to do good and bad using all this data and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, people have been trying to create models to predict the stock outcome of yeah. the stock market for centuries yes <laughs> oh, they have yeah exactly <clears throat> there's a film about it there's mm. a film called pie and the man is trying to unlock the secrets to the stock market through mm. mass <clears throat> he drills a hole in his head to help him with repanning <laughs> so sorry so <laughs> you're saying it's a load of rubbish then of course it is okay I'll right predict. fine okay it's, we'll move predict. on it's predicting the future it's crystal ball stuff nonsense <laughs> okay right we've got um we've got uh michael uh, mariner he asks uh, any thoughts on water intelligence um i know a bit about this because i own it um let me uh, mm, i'll leave that one to you then yeah let me just um oh, where's that gone damn okay i know where it is sorry let me just get the chart up there we go that's it yeah i mean basically this one does as, as people may or may not know it um, it does leak detection largely on a franchise basis model um, out in the states, and that's a really good solid business. I mean, the key secular growth drivers are water efficiency, water cleanliness, and and stopping sort of like you know 
the um, uh, you know sort of discharge of, of sewage and stuff like that in stormwater. Now this is really quite interesting. Its biggest business is in the states, but I don't know if I don't know if anybody's had a look at the news recently. But apparently they've had a flood of um, solid waste into the Thames and um, and 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 liquid waste into the Thames, and they took it on the BBC last night. They took a sample around. Uh, Chiswick Bridge, I think, or Putney Bridge, where the the Oxford boat race is going to be, and it came out yellow. It's the water, so it's an absolute disaster. And what the reason mm. is is because we've had so much rain across the UK that that's caused storm sewage to come out of the drains and everywhere. Um, and these guys actually do do products in the UK that help the utilities solve that problem as well. So when it comes to sort of like you know water intelligence, I would say. You know, this is not going to shoot the lights out, but it's a real rock. It's it's it, I've got it's a full position for me in my portfolio. This secular sort of like you know drivers of you know the whole you know climate change in terms of trying to stop the worst of 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 of, um, of droughts and water preservation, but also trying to stop the worst of the storm waters and uh, you know the extremes, etc. I just think this is in the right place at the right time. It's run by. You know, a management team that have done it for 20 years. It's come off a lot. It's cheap. And, um, I, you know, I'm just going to hold it myself. But um, I don't know if you've ever had a look at this. This is, I think, that yeah, I class this is a sleep at night safely stock. Yeah, I have had a, I've had a quick look at this. <clears throat> is it, I, I mean, <clears throat> thematically, I like, <clears throat> I like this sort of subset. So you've got another couple of companies that are involved in it in some way. We've lost you. Have you lost me? No, I don't know. That's all right. Uh, well, there you are. You got me. I've got there you. you go. So you're all right. Um, <clears throat> so you've got Ondo uh, insure tech in the UK, basically leak detection. Yes. Um, Water intelligence is much more established. It's basically yeah. a franchise, if I understand it. It's it is, back. yeah, in the states. Um, <clears throat> you know, so yeah, I, it's a sector that I I I, I was intrigued by. Um, and and uh, you know, water intelligence. I don't, I don't know why the share price has been going down. What's uh, what's happened there? Largely because of the the new build and housing out in the states, because it's right. been soft. You've because there just hasn't been, you know, that much development recently, then it benefits by new houses being built because it then has to do the leak detection on it and the franchise. And so that's 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 the reason why it was sold off. Right. Uh, you know, <clears throat> that will change if, if we because the interest rates hopefully are coming down, then that will um, that will improve. And we'll see, you know, it should benefit also by the infrastructure side in the yeah, state yeah. because obviously the Infrastructure Act. They came out with basically a bullish statement at the last trading update. Um and these are quite cautious guys. So, I mean, as I say, this won't, don't get me wrong, this will not shoot people's lights out. But if you, if you get 10, 15% total return, including the dividend over the long time, I'm as happy as Larry. I don't, I don't particularly, you know, I'd love to see it double like your H Vivo, but frankly, I'm very happy with that type of return. Yeah, nice steady growth. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay, good. Right then, let's um, let's move to another one you've owned, which is facilities um, of ADF, which does, I think, sort of like a, a trailer and tr trucks and stuff to help actors out in the field when they're sort of like film That's shooting. Great. And uh, <clears throat> it's a really unique business model, actually. But the shares have been hit because of the uh, the actors' strike and the director's strike last year, which put a sort of like a kibosh to a lot of new yeah. film development. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> no, I definitely missed time my entry into this one. <laughs> Um, because because that that strike has obviously you know sent sent ripples through through the entire um, film production industry. Yeah, um, that, Zoo Digital's <clears throat> another one, isn't it? Zoo Digital did get hit badly as well. What's yeah. their translation? Services. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, it does dubbing and stuff. Yeah, so so I've uh, seen this way. I mean, it, you know, it's its shares were hit quite hard. They they have sort of recovered some of that ground. Um, yeah, you know, since the resolution of the Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood writers strike. They did very well, you know, to 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 keep things going in the way they did, you know, during that because obviously they do a lot of work for some of the big, big streaming platforms, Netflix, you know, Amazon Prime, uh, mm -hmm. Disney, etc. Um, but they were able to shift, you know, they were to keep keep the the lights on, as it were, you know, by 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 sort of just jigging stuff around last year. Um, so yeah, we lost, you know, we saw we saw a sort of top line top line fall, but. But actually, we saw it. You know, they, they, it wasn't the the absolute disaster that that it could have been. Um, so so uh, you know, it's, it's, as you say, it's a very very unique business. There there aren't many people doing this sort of thing in the UK. Uh, it, it's uh, as as you as you point out, you know, sort of uh, uh, artists' cabins, makeup trailers, honey wagons. Which is what they call toilets in uh, in Hollywood. Oh, is that okay? 
<laughs> yeah, not Paul Toulouse. They got honey wagons. Um, yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, it, it has a very large fleet of vehicles, um, strategically located, so it can get you know access to. Yeah. So it's kind of all the studios that it needs to get to. Um, and, and you know, the, the backdrop of the streaming industry continues to invest heavily in content. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have a, a, a backlog, basically, of, of, of you know, stuff that was planned that, that was put on hold. So there's a lot of pent up demand. Um, you know, the, the sort of lingering after effects of the strike are still are still out there. Yeah, I'd you agree. Know, it's, it's, uh, there's some logistical issues that that continue, but 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 you know, it's in a very good place to pick up that business when it comes. The UK is uh, a a hotbed of film film investment at the moment. There's mm. there's already quite a few very large studios, and there's there are lots more being built all over the country. I think one up in Scotland, where I think uh, ADF has got got some uh, some presence. Um, yeah, so so you know, it's a it's a it's a great industry uh, and ADF is right in the heart of it. Mm. I think you raise a brilliant point there, John, um, because uh, you're right. This is we had a temporary pause of films, but frankly, if you've got a blockbuster and you haven't been able to finish it off or, or get it started, it ain't going anywhere. It's you're still going to do it. And it, it just built up a huge backlog. If anything, this is going to have really high utilization rates, you know, over the yeah, next sort of 18, yeah. 12 months, you know, 18 months, 36 months, et cetera. And once that happens, you get those economies of scale and you could really see effectively a, a huge surge in profitability over the next three to four years. You would you would think so. I mean, you know, it is a it is a sort of uh, a business that requires investment in in the sort of physical fleet. Um, so, so, you know, it, is, it, it requires a bit of cash to, 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 to do that. You know, it's, it's not, it's not like a software business, it's not a huge, you know, gross margin type business, but it is, it is, it is, you know, well, they can command pretty decent prices for what they do. Mm. Um, so, so it does make a, you know, a nice, a nice chunk of change. Uh, it was EBITDA last year, seven, it's 7.8 million EBITDA last year by 2020. Four, we should be up to 12, 12 million yeah. EBITDA. Um, yeah. But as I say, the DAR bit of that bothers me because, you know, honey wagons depreciate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, definitely worth having a look at. It's only a nine times PE as well. I've got um, just one sort of final observation from uh, George Allen again. He says he, he uses chat GPT to help him read earnings reports and financial hmm. statements. Is that something you might consider? I know you do a lot oh, of I, you do yeah. a lot of screening, don't you, already? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I would definitely... I do use ChatGPT for exactly that reason. You can pass stuff incredibly quickly. Mm. Um, and, and so you can be much, much more efficient in your use of time uh, to, to, to read uh, financial statements. Uh, screening, you know, I've got lovely tools to use SharePad for that, and, and that's something I am going to be setting up uh, come April as well, which is a, a sort of weekly screening video yeah. looking at various approaches to, to stop screening. Um, but, yeah, I just... I, just, I, I, I am... I am dubious about anything that can claim to see what happens in the future mm. uh, because, you know, the stock market ultimately is a, a collection uh, of the decisions of millions and millions and millions of individuals, human beings and human beings are inherently both predictable, but also unpredictable. You know, so so what, what, whilst you can sort of predict about the behavior of the masses for a while, um, there always comes a point where something strange happens and, mm. and the models can, can't predict that, that sort of thing. Mm. it's strange isn't it because obviously the mag 7 has been a huge theme just mm. based because it's like a safety trade it's the ai sort of craze mania plus obviously the passives on board and that seems to have gone further than most sensible investors would have expected and that's because of not not human beings make decisions a lot of it's just by machines make algos decisions. yeah but algos are algos i mean they're not intelligent are they really they're um they're they're, they're formulas um and, and and you know algos it's, it's also the, the speed at which you can transact which which often helps the algorithmic traders to to, to kind of gain their, their little edge um but 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 ultimately as i say i just i mean ai is it's amazing it's you know what it can do is it's fantastic it, it will change the the way that many industries work mm. um but but you know i don't think it displaces you know like human behavior and i, and I, I don't think you know it's, as i say claims that you know that it can do things like predict the future i just i mean that's you're you're in, you're in crazy territory when, when you start thinking like that um yeah. no it's it's fantastic stuff and as i say it's you know the amazing tools out there which which people should definitely use and, and yeah. i do why not why wouldn't you it'd be mad not to 
Okay, right. We'll finish on one prediction though, John. You're going to have to give me who's going to win the boat. Who's going to be in the boat race this weekend? Oh God, is there a, is there a boat race this well, weekend? Well, it must be because they're it's, talking it's... about the sewage levels in the Thames. I'm glad to say Cambridge because they're nearest to me. You've got a dark blue, aren't you? You got to be, but you got to be your Oxford. No, it's Cambridge. It's up the road. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> thanks uh, everyone for your questions. It's been uh, great to answer them, and uh, thanks again, uh, John, for terrific insights. And really looking forward to getting that um, to, to land the first. Uh, episode or the first uh, edition of the uh, the new edition. Yeah. yeah the new of the uh, of the growth company investor so thanks again and uh, speak to you in a couple of uh, months thanks paul thanks for having us oh is he gone bye